Welcome to Dorks. I'm Scott Solomon. My other uh, host, co-host Kelly Wienersmith, is unfortunately not going to be able to join us today, and she's experiencing a crazy winter storm where she lives. Um, but that's okay, because we have two very fantastic guests that are going to be joining us today, Dr. Philip Schwenk and Dr. Ainsley Sego. Hey, Philip. Hey, Ainsley. How are you guys? Great. Thank you. Absolutely excited to be here. Wonderful. I'm so happy that you're here. Uh, before we get to your presentations, let me just say a little bit about dorks and, and how this works for uh, anyone that might be joining us for the first time. So basically well, what we're going to do here in just a few minutes is hear a uh, brief presentation from uh, each of our guests and they're going to tell us about something that they um, are uh, an expert on or really excited about, really into, and, and that's the basic idea for dorks. It's people who are really passionate about a particular topic and, and knowledgeable about it come and they, and they tell us uh, why they like to dork out about that particular topic. So um, if uh, you have questions that you would like to ask for either of our guests, we encourage you to do that using the Q&A button at the bottom. Um, the chat function won't be working. So what you can do is uh, submit questions through that Q&A button and uh, we will see those and that will allow us to uh, ask those questions to each of our presenters after they uh, finish their, their presentations. And um, we also uh, will have some time at the very end to just kind of ask general questions and have a nice conversation with, uh, with both of our guests. So um, one of the other fun things that we like to do is to share a drink with uh, everybody that's joining us here. And uh, so for, for this week, um, we always do a cocktail and a mocktail. And this week I am drinking the mocktail, which Ooh. is very colorful. This is called the New Year Sunrise. And it's basically, it's orange juice, lemonade, and then a little bit of grenadine. And the grenadine is denser, so it sinks down to the bottom and kind of looks like a, a sunrise. And, you know, we try to find drinks that have in some way something to do with the topic of the week and this week our topic is light so you know sunrise sunlight light i don't know plus it's the new year and this is the new year sunrise so i'm gonna give it a try well it's good it it, it tastes like orange <laughs> juice and lemonade <laughs> it, can't go wrong what, uh, what are you drinking ainsley I'm drinking an Irish coffee because it's cold here and I needed a hot beverage. That sounds perfect. Wow. Well, enjoy. <laughs> Philip, so what are you drinking? I decided as uh, it's 9 p.m. in Germany, I decided to go for a German Pilz, a regional one, because I didn't have all the fancy liquors around for the laser beam. Hey, you can't go wrong with the German Pilz, especially when you're in Germany. So, yeah. Cheers. Okay. Cheers. Cheers to you. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, um, I also just want to uh, briefly mention um, before we get started that uh, Dorks now has a YouTube channel. So if you can't make the uh, live events like the one we're having right now, uh, we will be sharing these talks on, uh, on our YouTube channel later. We also have a Twitter account and we uh, will tweet out the, the link to the YouTube recording and also let you know about upcoming Dorks. Um, so feel free to follow us. It's at Dorks Chat on Twitter. So, all right, uh, let's go ahead and, and jump into it today. So our, our first guest is Dr. Ainsley Sego. And uh, Dr. Ainsley Sego is curator of invertebrate zoology at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History in Pittsburgh. And uh, so Ainsley has uh, all sorts of, of cool things that she does. And I'm not going to mention all of them now because maybe this will come up a little bit in our conversation later. So for now, I'll just start with the intriguing fact that her uncle Howie is the most famous Seago having appeared on Star Trek and the Next Generation. Wow, that's so cool. Is there a story behind that? Like, was he an, is, um, is he an actor? Like, what is he? Yeah, is he? He's, a, he's a deaf actor. He's one of, he was, or maybe still is one of America's foremost deaf actors. My family has some kind of uh, hereditary deafness, which only pops up in boys. And um, yeah, so he's appeared as 
a deaf guy in a whole variety of different movies and TV shows. That is a super cool uh, family lore fact. I love that. And uh, wow, uh, uh, I bet a lot of our uh, of our participants here are familiar with um, with Star Trek: The Next <laughs> Generation. <Star> Trek. <laughs> Perfect dorks uh, content. Yeah, excellent. So. Um, uh, Ainsley is going to be talking to us today um, about phototonic crystals as made by bugs. All right. Well, take it away, Ainsley. All right. I will start my little stopwatch here so I don't go careening wildly out of control. All right. And I will share my screen and throw up a PowerPoint. And is that displaying okay for everybody? Fabulous. All right. Howdy. Uh, welcome to my talk about photonic crystals and coleoptera. If you thought the theme of today's program was light and there were beetles, they were going to be fireflies. You're wrong. And let's find out how. Um, essentially, I'll be talking about how beetles evolved the ability to manipulate light from the sun. But to tell the story, we're going to start off with the most interesting beetles in the world, which are, of course, fungus beetles, especially those in the family Lyotidae. Um, this is the group that I did my undergraduate and graduate research on. Um, I'm a beetle taxonomist by trade. I describe new species and genera of beetles. I find out how they're related and how they evolved all of their weird little bizarre, exciting um, ecological features. But when you work on Lyotids, you're going to be working on beetles that are brown. They come in a variety of shades from light brown to quite dark brown. But when you are staring down the barrel of a box of Lyotids, it's going to look a lot like this. These are LBBs or little brown beetles. And there is no family of beetles, I would say, that's as good at being little round and brown as Lyotids are. That is their main feature. So you can imagine my surprise when roughly a thousand years ago, I was doing an undergraduate research project describing a few new species of lyotids that were a little round and brown and had really flamboyant antennae, when we noticed that there was something a little bit weird about some of them. A few of these new species had this rainbowy iridescent sheen to them. And that was really strange because there had literally never been a species of lyotid known to science that was anything besides brown. So we wanted to figure out why do they have this weird oily sheen? Is there something stuck to them? It was, was it the way they were collected? So I threw some of them under a scanning electron microscope and found out that the species that had the iridescence also had this interesting kind of rough microsculpture on the elytra or the wing covers. You can see a non-iridescent beetle has a very smooth elytron up there in figure eight. The iridescent ones have this kind of bumpy looking elytron in figure nine. And when you look at that in straight down dorsal view, what you'll see is this tiny little array of parallel ridges. This is, it turns out, a diffraction grating, which you might remember from your high school or college physics class, um, is any parallel array of ridges or slits that disperses or diffracts white light into its constituent wavelengths. So you get spectral iridescence. And this is uh, also what gives rise to the iridescent colors that you might see on this piece of ancient technology shown here. Parents in the audience, you can explain this to your children later. But this is different from the usual way that beetles make iridescence. Um, your standard iridescent beetle, like a fancy scarab or a dogbane leaf beetle, gets its lovely metallic colors from what's called a multilayer reflector or a thin film stack, depending on what your branch of science is. This is just a stack of alternating high and low refractive index layers of chitin that are exactly the right thickness, about one quarter of the wavelength of, of any given wavelength of visible light, and they will reflect that wavelength with constructive interference, which means you get super bright, super saturated, beautiful metallic colors. This is what it actually looks like if you take a slice of beetle and put it in a transmission electron micrograph. Um, this is a tortoise beetle in the family Chrysomelidae, and those little black and white stripes that you see in the figure at right are alternating layers of high and low refractive index chitin that produce this beautiful golden color. So this is pretty exciting. Um, I set out to look for diffraction gratings in other beetles since they'd never been described in Lyotids. What other families have them that we didn't know about? And it turns out that all of those families listed in bold are families that I discovered to have diffraction gratings that had never been documented before. Um, it turns out about 10% of all known beetle families 
have these structures on them. And not only that, they're actually pretty interestingly morphologically diverse. Some of them have little simple gratings. They're just a series of little slits in the cuticle. Some of them have sort of a sawtooth profile to the gratings. Some of them have these little ridges like we saw in the Lyotids. Some of them like this uh, melalonthine scarab have little series of kind of fringes or tabs that, that give rise to that iridescence. And there's even this great netadula that has what I describe as a waffle grating. It's got a bi-directional diffraction grating that generates a little spectral reflectance of iridescence in both directions at once. Um, and that's really cool. They're really widespread and they're a totally different mechanism from what we usually think of as beetle iridescence. And in the entomological literature, there is no attempt whatsoever to distinguish between these different kinds of iridescence. So I did the only thing that I know how to do, which is to write a big, really pedantic review paper about how to tell the difference between different kinds of beetle iridescence and structural color mechanisms and how to distinguish between them when you are describing a new species of beetle. While I was doing the research for this, um, I came across another type of beetle iridescence. So I uh, get a third mechanism to make iridescent colors in beetles. And this was first described in these beautiful weevils, which I like to call party weevils um, because they're so glittery and colorful and glamorous. And the first paper was published on it in about 2003. Andrew Parker published this very blurry micrograph of uh, the inside of one of these iridescent structures from these weevils and said, look, it looks like the close, closely packed crystal of that you see inside opal, the gemstone. So I think this is an opal analog in this weevil. What this actually is, if you look at it in a higher resolution with a much more careful uh, electron micrograph, is this really complicated uh, series of microcrystalline domains that are variously oriented to each other that are reflecting uh, with constructive interference, a particular wavelength of light, they've got almost a complete band gap. Um, this is a technology that humans hadn't really figured out how to fabricate until just a few decades ago. This is a three-dimensional photonic crystal. The multilayer reflector that we talked about earlier is in a sense its own type of photonic crystal, but it only has periodicity along one axis, along one particular dimension. Whereas uh, you see two-dimensional photonic crystals in a few species of insects, but in the weevils we have these really sophisticated, structurally complicated three-dimensional photonic crystals that are self-assembling inside their little iridescent hairs. So this is obviously super, super exciting. Um, it's a sophisticated, complicated photonic mechanism made out of this lightweight biodegradable substance that's widely and cheaply available called chitin. That's the building block of all bugs. And uh, there's a lot of potential for fun biomimetic engineering projects here, but I wanted to know how do the beetles do it? How does this actually assemble in the growing beetle? And how did it evolve at all in the first place? So the first step to doing this was to characterize the crystals inside the widest possible arrangement uh, array of different species iridescent scales. So I spent a lot of time as an Australian postdoc supposed to be working on something else, painstakingly shaving the individual scales off of weevils and sandwiching them in little tiny squares of mylar film so that we could take them down to the Australian synchrotron and examine them. Um, what you do using, we use a process called short angle X-ray scattering. You are just blasting a high energy X-ray beam through an individual weevil scale. And the pattern that these uh, those X-rays make when they come out the other side tells you exactly what kind of crystalline geometry is going on inside the sample. Here's the Australian synchrotron. Here's little baby postdoctoral me, absolutely lost in the sauce, drunk on my own power of using a particle accelerator with uh, eight different computer displays at once. It was very exciting. And here's what the data actually looks like when it comes out the other side. Um, the little white dots that you see there on the left-hand side uh, correspond to the peaks on the graph on the right-hand side. These describe the symmetry groups in the photonic crystal that you have just sampled. We published the results of this study in this highly accessible, extremely reader-friendly paper, which I am going to attempt to summarize now. So the first thing that we found is that there is a substantial diversity of both morphology and geometry across beetle and other insects, including butterflies, uh, photonic crystals. But when you look at them all together, you will observe that these are all different geometries and different types of crystal lattices that can be formed by the same process. Specifically, 
a lyotropic phase separation. And this might be the part in the talk where you're saying, Ainsley, that's just a whimsical combination of syllables. What are you actually talking about? So we've reached the salad dressing interlude. I want you to consider making a jar of salad dressing. It's, it's a vinaigrette specifically. You, you've got balsamic vinegar, you've got olive oil, you put them in the same jar. You shake it up with the lid on, and then you set it down. If you set it down and then wait long enough, those two elements are going to separate back out. But if you were to stop them in the middle of that separation, the structure that you would get would be not dissimilar to a lyotropic structure. It just means you have some amphiphilic molecules in a polar solvent, and they are going to automatically assemble into all of these structures shown here. The thing about this is that this is only something that can happen in solution. You need to have an aqueous environment. And this is really interesting because we only see photonic crystals inside scales or hollow hairs called CD. You don't see it in the cuticle itself. You don't see it in the exoskeleton. You just see it inside scales, inside hollow CD. So it seems like that actually might be an evolutionary prerequisite. You have to have a hollow environment where you can have that self-contained aqueous uh, substrate that can, that, where this reaction can take place. So is that what happened? Let's find out. We inferred the phylogeny of weevils and took all of the weevils that we could find that had three-dimensional photonic crystals. And it turns out, even though these are really widespread in weevils, they're very common, they all belong to the same clade, the one you see right here. Uh, these are the broad-nosed weevils. We also call them the entomini sensulatu in the, in the less strict sense. And uh, it looks like the three-dimensional photonic crystals are all within one group that has a single shared common ancestral lineage. And before that evolved, we actually see the origin, this transition from slender CD to flat rounded scales. We see flat rounded scales with a spongy disordered interior that just reflects white light, that scatters white light transitioning to that crystal lattice. And then later on within the end of mines, we see the transition from a, gyro a diamond or hexagonal crystal network to a gyroid one. So this actually lets us suggest a potential evolutionary pathway for how this could have evolved. Um, if you start off with simple scales that just have a spongy unordered matrix inside that can scatter white light, this provides you crypsis when you are a fungus or soil or rotting wood feeding or inhabiting beetle. When you make the shift to feeding on angiosperm foliage, you're going to want a way to be cryptic. And it turns out this is also the same time that we see these three-dimensional photonic crystals with a simple hexagonal morphology arriving. Um, and then derived from that seems to be the slightly more highly ordered gyroid crystals, which make really, really bright, sparkly, dazzling colors. And there are a lot of hand-waving hypotheses for the function of these. Um, but I'm not going to bet money on any of them just yet. So what we know about photonic crystals in beetles, especially the three-dimensional photonic crystals, is that we get high structural diversity from a very conserved toolkit. The toolkit is bug. It's photonic crystal, but made of bug. You only have chitin and some solvents to work with. Um, we know they can only develop inside of what appears to be a contained environment. They probably form through a lyotropic phase separation process because that is the best and simplest explanation for the diversity of structures that we see. And it seems like these may have evolved in concert with this ecological switch to feeding on broadleafed or angiosperm plants. And these photonic crystals are one of what I would call the Institute of Beetle Technology. In other words, the various solutions that insects have arrived at when they're facing a great big scary world with a lot of weird challenges. Um, there are a lot more like bombardier beetles and ultra powerful beetle adhesives and insects that can walk on water, but I will have to save those for another time because I think I am getting towards the end of my allotted talk time. So. Thank you so much for listening to my fire hose of beetle facts. And you can contact me anytime on the socials or the emails. And I would love to talk about weird bugs and iridescence with anyone. So thank you so much. Wow. Ainsley, that was amazing. I did not know about those uh, uh, crystals that you're describing. I mean, 
That that's fantastic. I'm, I also study insects, um, and I actually just released a series called "Why Insects Matter," uh, which is all about like the last thing that you were saying. Like you know, insects have come up with all these great, crazy solutions to problems that sometimes you know we have too. And uh, I, I I love uh, that aspect of entomology, right? I mean, insects are just a treasure trove. There's just so many that we know, and so many more that we don't know. <laughs> Um, but what a cool phenomenon. I, I want to ask you a little bit more about when you discovered this. So you talked a little bit about you were doing this review of different types of iridescence and you were aware of these two different mechanisms. Can you describe like a little bit more about how you found out about the, the phototonic crystals? Were you were you reading so, papers? Were you going through collections? How, how did that happen? So I did not discover photonic crystals. I did not right. discover photonic crystals and weevils. I was the first person to look at more than one species at a time and to actually put them in an evolutionary context. Mm -hmm. um, we are also the first to do a sort of comparative study of the photonic crystals in weevils as well as in bees as well as in butterflies. And so that's what led us to the conclusion that it was a lyotropic formation. Other people had suggested that maybe it was a template. So maybe you have sort of like a, they, they suggested the possibility of, let's say a um, endoplasmic reticulum makes that same sort of crystal looking structure, that same sort of lattice or network. Maybe that was arrested and then filled with liquid chitin that hardened later or something. But there really doesn't seem to be any um, support for that hypothesis of formation. Um, I discovered the diffraction gratings in, in the Lyotids just because I was looking at them for a taxonomic paper just describing a new species. And with the photonic crystals, that was a paper that I came across and thought, oh, I bet this is also present in a lot more things than anyone thinks. Um, there's a tendency with papers by engineers, no offense engineers, I love you all deeply, and physicists to um, study one thing. So for example, the morpho butterfly, there are maybe 40 or 50 different papers trying to explain exactly how the morpho butterfly makes its stunning iridescence. And they never put it in an evolutionary context and they never seem to talk to an entomologist about it. They just say, here is this bug, we're going to do science to it independent of its evolutionary history. So, uh, I, you know, I'm uh, as an evolutionary biologist myself, I, it's also where my brain goes immediately. It's like, well, did that evolve once or multiple times? Yeah. And, and, you know, exactly. when did it evolve and why did it evolve? And so I, 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 I'm, I'm also right with you on that same train of thought. That was the first question I wrote down as you were talking is, wait a second, did this evolve once or multiple times? Um, but it sounds like within the, that group of beetles, the broad nose weevils, right? That that was like one evolutionary ev event that then diversified, right? Mm -hmm. But you mentioned other insects. Uh -huh. So it sounds like it did evolve multiple times within insects. Can you talk a little bit more about, about that? Well, the um, essentially the inverse of that structure evolved in longhorn beetles and lamiae and cerambicids. Um, you also see it in some Butterflies. Butterflies have a couple of different ways to make colors, um, much like the beetles do. Um, they don't have diffraction gradings, so far as I know, so beetles are still coming out ahead on that one. Take that, butterflies. Um, but they, uh, it, seems, it seems to be an advantage when you want to change color relatively evolutionarily rapidly or metabolically quickly. In things like a sphinx moth larva, a lot of their color is strongly affected by what they eat. The chemistry that makes their colors, their pigment-based colors, is really dependent on getting the right diet. And if they get the right diet, they will, if they get the wrong diet, they will be the wrong color. Um, whereas if you are an a uh, beetle, once you have eclosed from your pupa into an adult beetle, you cannot change your color. You can, there's a few that have special secret ways to do reversible color change, which is a different paper that I wrote, but mostly you have a fixed color and you want to make that as easy as possible. And so instead of synthesizing pigments using your own metabolism, why not harness this little photonic crystal where just a slight little tweak to the, um, the concentration of your chitin molecules and solvents during pupation will give you different colors. There's a paper on this called a tunable rainbow describing um, some really schmancy, the photonic crystals behind the schmancy colors in Pachyrhynchus weevils that just came out a couple of years ago. So it seems to be basically a metabolically cheap way to have really bright, fancy colors. Yeah. Wow. So cool. Oh, so we are starting to get some questions coming in on the q and I'll encourage 
uh, others to submit questions there. I did want to get Philip uh, in on the conversation. Philip, did you have any uh, questions you wanted to ask Ainsley? Yes, absolutely. I mean, this is a wonderful talk and a very fascinating cap uh, topic you're working on there. I was especially intrigued by this little brown beetle, a little brown box that suddenly are much more interesting than they look like. I mean, I'm a plant physiologist. I, I took my courses in entomologist, entomology and quickly forgot about them, to be honest. Uh, sorry there, no offense. They're interesting, but uh, yeah, plants were more interesting to me at this point. Uh, no, what I wanted to ask, you have this, this group of little brown beetles, you call them. I forgot the Latin name, I'm sorry there. And they are like, some of them have this iridescence. Do they somehow, this, the ones that have iridescence, do they uh, have a certain ecological niche? Do they somehow, can they be attributed to one fact why they have iridescence? I mean, they're not looking like green and living on the yeah. leaf and try not to be eaten by birds, but like, what is their yes. advantage of being iridescent? Actually, yes. Those little brown beetles, the family Lyotidae, my beloved precious fungus beetles, and all of the other ones that I found with diffraction gratings all share the common feature of mostly being either fungus beetles or found in a moist, wet, damp substrate. Like they are in rotting wood, they are in rotting fungus, they are in slime molds, they are in leaf litter. Uh, they are in a muddy habitat or in freshwater, and there actually seems to be some evidence that the diffraction grating acts as a friction reduction mechanism. And I have been collaborating with some folks at the University of Illinois, um, trying to figure out basically dragging the beetles across various substrates to see whether or not the diffraction grating reduces friction, and it appears that it does. Yeah, this was actually... Kind of, I kind of answering my second question already. If it changes also the surface properties in terms of like lotus effects, it does. Uh, and if there's any herpetologists or herp enthusiasts in the audience, they actually um, you will see diffraction gratings like this on snakes and lizards that are ground dwelling or burrowing as well. Yeah, yeah. it's super interesting. Wow, I mean, and it's like that's the way evolution works so often, right? Something evolves for one thing. And then, you know, later it turns out, oh, and this same thing can be used for this completely different function, but that's not why it evolved in the first place. Yeah, if I add, maybe may add one question. Um, you said that basically this, this, uh, this is basically a phase separation process, how it's built up. I'm kind of interested myself in phase separation, but in other contexts. Um, and you said that there is solvents, are these solvents excreted or are these taken from the environment or, uh, is this up to, I don't know? It's probably something coming from the bug itself. I mean, a polar solvent can just be water, right? Um, and when you are, this, this formed during pupation. So they're already, the photonic crystals are fully formed by the time the insect is done, by the time it emerges from its pupa. And when an insect pupates, it goes from being a larva to being a bag of soup to being an adult. And when it is in the bag of soup phase, it's just completely oh. rearranging. It has a few little imaginal disks that are little clusters of cells that will become antennae and wings and, and legs, but otherwise it just turns to goo. And so there are lots of different goo-based opportunities for, um, for aqu different aqueous substances to be deposited. But the problem is with broad-nosed weevils, they pupate underground in the soil. And so getting lots of their pupae to cut open and study with a TEM at different stages of development is really, really hard. You have to go dig up a whole tree to get one pupa. And so it's very difficult to do this um, experiment uh, in the lab. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So we have uh, some great questions coming in on the Q&A. So Autumn, uh, Autumn England wants to know, what is the iridescent structure in bee wings or fly wings? I've seen that sometimes too. You look at their wings yeah. and you see like, a, like an iridescence. And it's, it's actually diagnostic. Like it's actually a species specific feature in some, um, some species of flies, especially in a few Hymenoptera too. Um, that's a thin film reflector. Um, that's similar to the same kind of iridescence or interference colors that you see on the, you know, oil slick on top of a puddle. Um, so yeah, that's a thin film or multi-layer reflector. So uh, Jimmy Acevedo says, you mentioned hooks for bio, uh, biomimetic engineering. Is that something you've tinkered with? What are some of the first steps that might be taken to play around with this tech? How possible might it be? 
and if possible, how practical, to tailor structure for more specific optical properties like specific colors, peaks, or transmissivity? Um, there are a bunch of graduate students already working on this. There's a lot of cool papers coming out of China. People have done things like made structurally colored uh, chitin-based tissues or threads for making clothes out of. Um, people have made synthetic or bio-templated photonic crystals based on the beetles uh, photonic crystals. And so people who are very good at organic chemistry and polymer chemistry are working on this right now. I am just a humble entomologist. And part of the reason that I moved to Pittsburgh for my job here at the museum is because we're right next to Carnegie Mellon University. And I intend to fully parasitize all of their polymer chemists to look at more potential bio-inspired projects. Cool. Uh, Bill Rokenbeck is asking, are the silica microspheres in opal also a lyotropic formation? I have no idea. Do I look like a geologist? geologist? Yeah. <laughs> Ask a geologist. You did spend time in Australia though, right? You mentioned that you um, were a postdoc there. Um, yeah. uh, how long were you there? Just 12 years. Um, I got my PhD in 2008, which as some of us may recall was a really rad year for the global economy. And I was offered a postdoc and said, I'll take it. And I thought, I'll just do one three year long postdoc in Australia and then I'll come right back to America where things will be great. And I came back <laughs> in 2020. So um, it's, a it's a great country though, really cool amazing bugs. If you like bugs or reptiles, it is a radical place to be. For any biologist, and I guess for geologists too, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderland. What, where were you in Australia? Um, Canberra, Sydney, and a tiny little town called Orange in sheep, in sheep country in New South Wales. Oh, wow. Very cool. Very cool. All right. Let's uh, see what other questions we have. Um, so let's see. Um, Oh, Autumn England, she, she was actually one of our uh, guests on a previous uh, dorks. She's asking, is the iridescence only on the shell of the beetle? I guess, meaning the, the exoskeleton. Uh, what about the underside or, um, or on the wings? Do, do their wings, I guess their wings are elytra though, right? But those are the wing covers. What about the flight wings? In most species of beetle, the elytra are really their main interface with the world. Those are the um, outer, that's the front first pair of, of flight wings that have been sort of modified into being a shield for their delicate flight wings that fold up underneath the elytra. And in the photonic crystals, that's only inside the scales or the hairs that are on the whole body. So those are individual scales or hairs that can be on the elytra, the head, the antennae, the feet, whatever. With diffraction gratings, we only see that on the, um, the dorsum of the body. We see it on the elytra and sometimes we see it on the pronotum as well. Um, there, I don't know if there's anything about iridescence like interference colors and beetle, beetle flight wings. We try not to talk about the flight wings because they're full of really unpleasant morphological characters that nobody really wants to look at. Um, <laughs> that's a different conversation. Um, Fair enough. Yeah. Well, Martha says, uh, thank you for the interesting talk. Nerdy question from a structural chemist. We love those. Do you always get nice single crystals or do you see a lot of diffuse scattering when putting the crystals into x-rays since the crystal layers do not stack perfectly? They don't stack perfectly, but we seem to, if we do it carefully enough, we can get the, um, the x-ray beam focused on just one micro domain on one particular lattice. So like I said, there's lots of different little lattices all mushed together. If you look at a single uh, scale, you'll see this almost glittery effect from the differently oriented micro domains, but we're usually able to focus on just one of those and get them and get a pretty clear picture. Another one of our former guests, Rosemary Mosco is asking, uh, or, or saying uh, that she sometimes finds fossorial snakes or other very secretive snakes uh, that have an iridescent sheen. So are you saying that maybe they're shiny to reduce friction when they're slithering underground? Yes. And I think that iridescent sheen is probably from a diffraction rating if you looked at it under a scanning electron microscope. But more importantly, Rosemary, I have an answer to this, which is specifically tailored for you, not by me though. There was a um, researcher, I think it was Carl Gans, 
um, who worked on reptiles at maybe the Natural History Museum in London or something like that a long time ago. He noticed these diffraction gratings. He noticed these sort of iridescent structures. And he thought, I bet that these iridescent structures and lizards and snakes that are burrowing are for shedding mud and soil. And the way that he tested it is he developed a standard batch of mud and painted little patches of it onto some preserved reptile specimens. And then he counted how many strokes of a feather it took to remove the mud. And that was his quantification of friction or of mud adhesion. And I think his results were a little inconclusive, probably because that is an absolutely bonkers way of doing any kind of quantitative biology. But um, yeah, so he used he used a feather to brush the mud off of them to see if so that you're saying this has not mind. become a standard technique in the field. Sadly, no, but I think it's <laughs> hilarious. Um, what we actually do now is we take a force transducer and drag a little piece of animal, or if it's a small bug, the whole animal across a substrate and use the force transducer to measure how much frictional force it generates. So I kind of think people in my institute used to like put them on little CD players, modified CD players, and saw how, how fast they have to spin the disc until it flies off. That's a good one. I really like that. That's fantastic. I can't believe CDs are coming into this twice. Yeah, basically. I was just thinking that. <laughs> <laughs> ancient technologies. Do not under underestimate ancient technologies. <laughs> All right. Well, let's see. Uh, I think we can maybe do one more question and then uh, we will um, give uh, uh, things over to Philip. Let's see. Um, so, oh, okay. So um, Jimmy Acevedo is saying, can you talk more about the link between Cripsis and these optical properties? How are you able to draw those inferences over the long evolutionary time scales? Um, basically, we're inferring that being green helps you blend in when you're eating green plants, and it's about a five-year-old level of reasoning, and I'm okay with that. Um, green and blue are some really hard colors to make when you're a bug. Um, a lot of insects that are that have a green that's based on pigments have to, again, like those hornworm larvae, sequester certain chemicals from their diet in order to be green. They don't seem to be something that's easy to synthesize, like a carotenoid or whatever would, or a, you know, flavonoid or whatever would be. So they really are, it's a, it's this structural colors are a great way to make colors that are very hard or impossible to make with pigments. So that's really my answer for that. Um, and in terms of the crypsis, that's something that you could probably test, but testing insect crypsis is a whole other field of behavioral uh, ecology and um, visual ecology. And I can recommend papers on it, but I myself have not done that. I'll take the uh, the opportunity to ask the the you the last question here before we go to to Philip. So you mentioned that there were some uh, what you described as hand wavy hypotheses for why you get these such elaborate um, colors uh, in in some of the weevils. Uh, what is if we, we put you on the on the spot? Like what what is you know what do you think? What do you think is going on? Do you have a favored hand wavy hypothesis? I think the current least stupid hypothesis is that those um, party weevils that I showed you, those disco weevils, they are the main weevils that have three dimensional photonic crystals but aren't exclusively green. Almost all the rest of them are green. The main ones that aren't are those Pachyria ringkind party weevils, and those guys are some of the hardest beetles known to science. These are things that you often need a drill to, or a hammer to get a pin into. Um, and there is actually a whole suite of longhorn beetles that mimics them using independently evolved photonic crystals in their scales. And it seems like it might be a form of, of a postsomatic coloring. It might be a warning that we're really hard. Don't try to eat me, I'm hard. Um, that's never been formally described. There's not really a theoretical framework around, you know, we have a postsomatic advertisement of chemical defenses. That's really well known and well studied, but a postsomatic advertisement of I'm hard. Yeah, right, <laughs> so that's interesting. That's the theory. Um, yeah. Otherwise, they just like to party. <laughs> they are spectacular. That is for sure. Super interesting. Well, this was great. Uh, Ainsley, thank you so much for a phenomenal presentation. And uh, if you can stick around, we will uh, we'll ask you some more questions at the very end. But um, now I want to hand things over to our next guest, Dr. Philip Schwenk. 
Um, so Dr. Philip Schwenk is a postdoc in the Faculty of Botany at the University of Freiburg in Germany, uh, where he is graciously joining us, even though it is fairly late in the evening in Germany. And on top of that, um, I understand, uh, Philip, that uh, you're in the midst of a D&D &D marathon weekend. So, wow. So even more uh, impressive that you've uh, uh, agreed to take the time to join us. How's it going? Actually, it's going fantastic, uh, but I'm like not slept so much today. So uh, <laughs> let's just see where things are going. And uh, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, that's great. So um, um, great. You you want to set up your talk here at all? I don't know. Um, I, I don't. For some reason, I don't have the title in front of me. So um, apologies. Oh, there it is. Do plants see light? All right. Take it away, Philip. Okay. Thanks, Scott. Um, so after a wonderful talk about lights and bugs, I want to know, talk a little bit about plants and light, uh, light and plants that way around, uh, because I'm absolutely fascinated by the question how and how plants see light, and maybe also going a little bit, and should we care about it? Like, like how, why should we care of how plants see light? Okay, um, and I want to start this off with this picture. This picture, if I would ask you what is this a picture of, most of you would probably answer, yeah, some monkeys. Um, this is true, there are some monkeys in this picture, but most of the picture is actually plants. Um, this is simply human because we like to ignore plants somehow. They are like, usually non-threatening, they don't move. So yeah, not so interesting sometimes, but I might want to, I want to try to share a little bit my fascination why plants are indeed uh, deserving our attention. Um, one key difference between animals and plants is that animals can move and plants can't. So in case an animal is facing, uh, well, conditions which are unfavorable, it will just move away and find conditions which are more favorable. Uh, whereas the plant is simply stuck at a place where it once germinated and has to deal with everything nature throws at it. So that's why plants are pretty, pretty good at adapting to their environment. Um, and just to show you this, that especially light is very, very instrumental there. Uh, this is a potato plant. There's a very typical potato plant in grown in light here. You see it's rather short, it has this open leaves, does photosynthesis and does very, very potato things. Um, when we grow the same plant with the same genome, like the same species in darkness on the other hand, it looks completely different. It has this very slender appearance. It really changes its developmental program from this to this, just from one environmental curve, just to deal somehow with the environment around it. Um, and this is something which is pretty special to plants because when we think about animals, like this giraffe here, uh, it's adapted to like has this, this long neck to eat leaves of tall trees. And if we take an individual of the species and just raise it in proximity to small bushes and uh, yeah, well, not tall trees, it will still grow a long neck, will not become a giraffe with a short, short sturdy neck and short sturdy legs. So principle, uh, plants are, need to adapt to the place of growth and are thereby much more plastic than animals. Maybe with the exception of the transition from a larvae of a back to an um, imago, but that's also something different. Um, yeah, I was talking about light at this point, but plants encounter, of course, much more in their environment. This is a picture of a gorge near Freiburg. This is the Wutach Gorge. If you're ever visiting South Germany, share it a visit. It's a wonderful place for hiking. There you can already see some plants in the picture and some things plants encounter in their life. For example, they encounter light. So light is different in different parts of a gorge. Um, they encounter competitors. So other plants are around it and sunlight is, for example, especially in a gorge, a limited supply. So plants compete around it. They have limited nutrients and the nutrients are also changing. So a plant is dependent where the seed has fallen, that the nutrient, it has, it has to deal with the nutrients around. Some go, same goes for bugs. So herbivores, pathogens, all are attacking uh, my precious plants and plants have to somehow defend themselves against and uh, well, adapt. And yeah. And if I talk about light plant, the first thing comes to mind is of course, uh, photosynthesis because our wonderful green plants do this amazing thing of having chloroplasts in their cell like little organelles, which harvest the energy of light and use this to make carbon dioxide and water to energy and oxygen, which we can breathe. So far, school book knowledge, 
We all know this, this is absolutely important for our life. But there's more in light uh, than just energy. There's also information in light. So like the intensity of light, how much light is there, uh, the spectra of light, like what color light have. And yeah, of course, light changes over time. For example, the day night cycle. So tells the plant how long is a day, thereby what time of the year it is. And yeah, also the direction of light. Oh. And if we ask what is the antenna, or like what is, what is the moiety uh, for it, biologists looking for a receptor. And yeah, at this point, I want to talk like, how did people find a receptor for light? And I want to make now some minutes of uh, science history. Um, yeah, because most of this has been done in a very famous place. That's the Arlington Experimental Farm in the 20s. Basically, the foundation of all uh, light signal research has been done here. This is, and you can already see uh, in this wonderful picture, what you need for this is some tracks, which are light type, and uh, plants on wheels, which can be pulled in and out of these boxes. And why am I showing you especially this? Because I guess most of the, the majority of the uh, audience knows this place, not necessarily by Arik Experimental, but this is the place where the Arik Experimental once stood. And this is basically the shape of the Pentagon is the shape of the Arik Experimental Farm, which was before there. Okay, and what did people do there? They were looking for a uh, reaction of plants to light. And now I want to show you the, the most important experiment in photoreceptor history. Um, so they looked basically at lettuce seeds, so salad, and checked what light can I give that this seed would germinate. So like you see here, these little white things, these are the germinated seeds, and looking in a Petri dish. And they saw, okay, red light, is really good at triggering germination. But when they gave this plant red light followed by a far red light pulse, so far red light meaning near infrared light, they could suppress this effect. So then no germination would be happening. They repeated this, giving a red light, a far red light pulse, and a red light pulse, again germination, and a far red light pulse, turning it off again. So you see where this is getting. They could switch the system on and off again all the time and deduce from it, hey, there must be a receptor somewhere in this plant that can be turned on with red light and turned off with far red light again, like a toggle switch. Um, yeah, so this is, I think, the starting point here. And people were not really believing them at this point and said, oh, yeah, you guys are looking for your pigment of the imagination. Um, and basically, they, said, they took the challenge and said, yeah, there needs to be a pigment, so something that is absorbing light. That is switching between two states, one in red and one in far red light, one in this, uh, they called it photoreceptor red light absorbing. Absorbing red light would become a photoreceptor far red light absorbing, which again, the far red light would go back to the red light absorbing stage. And they said, okay, this far red light absorbing state must be exerting its biological function. For example, in the seed germination assay, the last uh, the activating stack was the red light absorb, uh, the red light. So producing this PFR, so this photoreceptor in far red light. And they said, okay, this is absorbing red and far red light. So it should look blue and turquoise. It should be interconvertible. Now I'm doing a fast forward of 30 years of hardcore biochemistry. And they <laughs> identified indeed a protein that had exactly this property. So they found a protein which it could purify from plants, which was blue. And after giving a red light, it became turquoise. After giving far red light, it became blue again and could that cycle around for ages. And of course, when they got measured spectrum and did really science with it, uh, not just switching it back and forward, um, they could see that their one form was really uh, absorbing between 600 and 700 nanometers. So in the red light state and the PFR, so the upper form was absorbing between 700 and 800. So in the, P, uh, in the far red light state. And very creatively, they called it phytochromes, so plant colors. Okay. so. Wonderful, we have a receptor. The problem is solved, right? We now know how plants see light. Yeah, not really. Um, plants, so perception of light is one thing. The other question is how is this like then transduced to this very, very fancy, how they change their uh, behavior, how they, how they change their development. This is absolutely interesting, but it's also absurdly complex. And I want to spare you now the hardcore molecular biology stuff here. And I want to go to another question. Um, this red far red light reversibility, so changing between red and far red, 
sounds pretty artificial. I mean, this is when when in the world does a plant receive uh, pure red or pure far red light? Not really, right? And people always said, okay, this is a lab artifact. Does this have any real world relevance? I want to show you now that it indeed has real world relevance. Because when we look at where a plant is put be growing, I made, or not me made, people made a little drawing here. Um, the plant could be either growing in an open environment, like a field, or in a very dense forest uh, where it's shaded by a dense canopy. And when we now look in the open world environment, we have basically a equal composition of the, the spectrum of far red, red, and blue light. Okay, so all light colors together. And when we now look at the canopy and the dense canopy, red and blue would be absorbed by the, uh, by the plant, by the plants for doing photosynthesis with this. And only far red light is able to penetrate through this. So we already have, you see that there is a difference in the light composition between an open habitat and a closed habitat or a shaded habitat. Um, we can also see this in the light spectra. So here in, what is see here is basically a spectrograph, like uh, how much light of a certain wavelength is seen in sunlight here in yellow. We see in the red light area between 600 and 700, we have e roughly equally the same like in 700 and 800. So plus minus the same amount of red and far red light. When we now look at canopy shade here in green, we see everything is filtered out for photosynthesis by uh, overtopping plants. So no red light, no blue light, but far red light, Oh, still quite a lot there. But now think we have this wonderful system of, uh, if we have a, a protein which is absorbing in red light and can be recalled, um, the PFR, that active PFR state can again absorb far red light and revert back. This means that in a situation where we have full sunlight, we have an equilibrium which has much more PFR. Whereas when you have a situation where we have only canopy shape, where we barely have any red light, we would have much more PR because there's much more far red light pushing it to the PR side. So that's active by the dome. And when we now look again at our habitat, we can basically see, okay, uh, we have on the y-axis here, the amount of EFR, like how much active phytochrome, and on the x-axis, how much red to far red ratio, like, and in the canopy, deep shade, we don't have any uh, or barely any red light. So that very few active phytochrome and in the open field environment we have a lot of active phytochrome so a lot of pfr in between we have something in between where it slowly slowly changes so this equilibrium between pr and pfr is basically telling the plants how much shade do i have and do i have to respond to this and to answer now the question how do plants respond to this this is a wonderful uh, picture of chenopodium plants which have been grown under different uh, red to far red light ratios. So this plant was grown in full red light. And then we show see a relatively short plant and the more far red light we give, the longer the plant becomes because it tries to evade the overtopping canopy, tries to penetrate through the canopy and well, receive light uh, and do photosynthesis with this. Um, this is of course now again with this very artificial red and far red light. Does this work in an uh, open field scenario? And in this uh, experiment, they simply grew in plants in the open field and put to the side of it um, foils which would either be reflecting red or far red light. So basically this plant would get the full spectrum of sunlight um, which would then be supplemented with red light reflected from this foil or far red light reflected from the far red light foil. And as you can see already here, we see a change in growth. We see that this plant is really seeing, oh, there's too much far red light here. Probably I'm shaded by another plant. I should grow up. So yes, plants do need this red and far red light perception to adapt to the growth to optimize their uh, photosynthetic state. But this also tells us, especially this picture, that uh, plants can use this to anticipate further sh future shading. Because if you now think we have this, uh, we have a big tree in a, in a, uh, yeah, in a field, and besides that, no, no tree. And we look how this the light composition in each of these comp uh, conditions. If we look in a completely open sunlight, we have all light colors available. So we have a high red to far red ratio. Plant knows, okay, no one is overtopping me, I'm fine. I can do photosynthesis as much as I want. If I go to below directly bit road tree, we have really not much red light anymore because everything is absorbed by this tree, the lowest red to far red light ratio. 
Landau's deep shade, I somehow have to adapt to deep shade. But what is happening if, I, if a plant is beside the tree, not yet shaded by it? It would receive the full spectrum of sunlight by the sun, so all colors, but it would additionally receive uh, additional far-red light reflected by the tree, resulting in a lowered red to far-red light ratio, inactivate some phytochromes from the pool of phytochromes, and so the plant knows, ah, soon I will be shaded. There's something besides me. I might start should the grow to await this plant before it overtopples me. So, and Scott, at how much time am I? In? I'm sorry. You're fine. You can go for a few more minutes. Yep. Oh, okay. Perfectly. Because then I can uh, take you, first of all, some take home message at this point. I find plants, plants fascinating, and plants are really good at using light as a source of information. This information is gathered by specific receptors, for example, phytochromes. Um, I've spared you now to go through the, the whole family. And this information is absolutely used to adapt to environmental conditions, and plants are really, really good by this. And one thing, if I have one more minute, I would like to talk about is, ah, now we know about this uh, fancy phytochrome stuff, can we do something cool with this? And I have now to go a little bit clicky, clicking ahead because I rearranged my slides recently. And uh, what people have been asking, if we can use these photoreceptors to control cellular functions in our system, for example, in animal cells. And to this, you have to know that, the, that there is proteins, for example, PIF6. I don't want to go into details about PIF6 now. Uh, this would be another two hour talk. Um, but PIF6 is a protein which specifically, specifically interacts with PFR, only with the active phytochrome, but really does not interact with PR. So basically what does interacting mean in biology? It, it sticks together. So once we shine light on, Phytochromes and PIF6 is around, phytochrome will stick to PIF6, and with far red light, it will unstick again. Uh, what we can do with this, we can fuse proteins to this. Um, this is something we do in molecular bi biology uh, quite often. That's a pretty simple, straightforward process. So we can uh, fuse a protein to PIF6, a protein 2 to phytochrome, and with red light, now protein 1 and protein 2 stick together because phytochrome and PIF6 stick together. So we have a can bring together uh, protein one and two under control of light. And what people have been doing a lot is, or what people have been doing is they fuse to PIF6, a protein which binds to specific DNAs and to phytochromes, uh, proteins that are genetic activators. And then they made cool things with this. Um, what they did is they constructed uh, synthetic genes where they had a gene of interest. So anything we like, which is under control of a promoter, which is inactive. So something that would drive its expression if an activating protein would be in close proximity. And things where our PIF6 with a DNA binding domain can bind to. And also they would have around in a cell floating around phytochromes boost to a genetic activator. Now, when we give red light to this, phytochromes would bind to PIF6, bring this activator close to the minimal promoter, and drive this expression of this uh, gene of interest and can also turn this off again by giving far red light by unsticking PIF6 and phytochromes. So and with this, uh, people can actually, yeah, well, control gene expression with light. And just to show you as an example, um, a colleague who graduated in a lab in our institute, Hannes Bayer, he made a demonstrator here where he have his personal smartphone and on top of it, a cell culture dish, which uh, then uh, where a layer of uh, an, uh, mammalian cells has been seed, uh, seeded on, which have been transformed with exactly this. So it has a PIF6 binding to a synthetic gene with a minimal promoter, which is inactive without an activation domain, and a gene of interest. And the gene of interest in this case was a fluorescent protein, which we could visualize under a microscope. And after projecting this red light circle just with a smartphone onto this uh, cell culture dish and then putting it to the microscope, we could see here in white the fluorescent protein only being active in uh, a much plus minus ring like structure with a very primitive illumination like a smartphone, which is much better if you use a high quality laser. So um, there's a lot of possible cool applications for this. This can be uh, used for the release of pharmace pharmaceutical drugs upon light. Um, in, for example, uh, animals or 
like thinking far into the future, maybe even humans, but let's keep things uh, where they are at the moment. Um, this can be used to differentiate due to spatial resolution tissues in uh, different tissue cultures. In combination with 3D printing, we can again think ahead. Maybe this can be helped to, well, 3D print organs in one day. And something that is coming more and more close to real world application is um, after surgery, sometimes biogels or hydrogels are implanted. And by adding phytochromes and phytochrome interacting proteins to this, uh, one can change the material properties of this by shining light of those and thereby making hydrogels more rigid or less rigid without reopening a surgical wound and having to put additional stress to the uh, patient. Okay, this was just a short go through through uh, these things. And so we can do a lot of cool things with light. And I hope I could share a little bit my fascination about how plants sense light in yeah, open world environment. At this point, I want to thank you for your attention. I want to thank my group where I'm a postdoc at, at the University of Freiburg and a group of Andreas Siltbrunner. If you're curious about this kind of stuff, feel free to contact me on Twitter. Feel free to look at our website. And thanks for Kelly and Scott for having this wonderful seminar seri series. And at this point, yeah, let's discuss a little bit if you're interested about it. Thank you, Philip. That was really cool. Um, and I love the history that you added in the beginning too, because I, you know, I, I had no idea that the Arlington Experimental Farm became the Pentagon. Like that's so. These are the exact same sites. Like it's literally the Pentagon is built on the site of the Arlington Experimental if, Farm. If I understood it correctly, the the uh, shape of the Pentagon is actually derived from the field shape of the Arlington Experimental. But honestly, this is the one source uh, I had there, so. Maybe it should be taken with a grain of salt there, but at least it's the same size. No, that's it. I'm I'm definitely gonna gonna look into that because that's that's such a cool uh, historical fact. Um, awesome. So again, I'll encourage folks to submit questions. I see uh, we've got a few already. Um, I wanted to ask. So you were talking about how plants can anticipate that their light situation is going to change, and then maybe turn genes on and off. Is is the same thing true of a uh, uh, you know plant that um, you know, germinates in a forest, it's going to be in a shaded environment, it's going to need more of the far red light. But then if it grows up and reaches the canopy, it is no longer in a shaded situation, presumably, uh, they can change the expression of, of which genes are, are, are active to reflect the, the light environment. Is that, is that what happens? Yeah, basically, it's something like this. Um, so you have like different photoreceptors do different things. I, I simplified a bit now for the, for the sake of the course. But in the, like in the soil, seeds are basically usually buried a bit. So they are waiting for really minimal amounts of light to just trigger germination. And this is basically done, um, yeah. At, as soon as they see a little bit of light, they will start germinating. First of all, they don't see much light. So they will do this very slender thing, which I showed in the beginning with this potato plant, try to push through the soil. And then at some point they will see okay, here is more red light now, a little bit more. Depending on the ratio, it will say, okay, I go now full photosynthesis if there's a lot of red light. If there's a little bit of red light, it will just go, okay, maybe a little bit more slender tall growth and then opening full photosynthesis. But if there's, there's one thing, if there's really not much, really, really, it doesn't reach uh, any amount of red light that is like, feasible, there will be a developmental switch also to just say, okay, this is not going to work out. I just try to make thicker leaves, more chloroplasts. I try to make do what I have here. And one has to also make a uh, uh, point out that there is also plants which are not evading shade, but they're shade tolerant, which don't do this shade evasion. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, uh, Angel, I'll get to you in just a second. I just, I had to share a, a, an observation because I uh, one time was very, very surprised to notice in a cave uh, that a, uh, somehow a seed had been um, uh, dragged in, presumably by some, uh, some kind of an animal. And it, it had fully germinated, it had leaves out and everything, and obviously it had no future, the poor thing. But um, I was amazed that it got as far as it did, right? And so this is clearly a plant that has grown up in, uh, no, not just no far red, like absolutely no light whatsoever. And so, I, I mean, this is just purely stored energy at this point, presumably, right? Yeah, absolutely. This is like, there's, there's no re, re, not energy around, uh, no light around. It will just use up the energy in the seed. 
this is something we call e, an emergency germination. Um, so what is happening in the, in the seed when it uh, contacts water? So two things have to come together for seed to germinate. It's water and it's light. Um, what is happening in water is that the seed's coat will like shrivel a little bit and then a hormone starts building up, gibberellic acid. And at some point, the level of gibberellic acid needs to overcome a first threshold where it then becomes susceptible to light and to just germinate. If it doesn't see light then, the levels of, uh, of gibberellic acid will rise, 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 and rise until it reaches the second threshold where it just, okay, I give up, there's no light. Let's, let's just see anything above me. It's over now anyhow. But again, this is very species specific, how direct it is, and yeah. Yeah, but in principle, they try to, they have to try to make do what is around. They cannot move away. Right, right, exactly. Ainsley, you had a question. Uh, yeah, just a quick question. Um, I wonder if anyone has looked at um, anal look for analogous proteins or signaling in fungi, not in the fungi that spend all of their lives underground, but in the ones that are a little bit, you know, you're a little guild fungus with a cap and you're going to grow up through the soil and you want to hit the air so you can disperse your spores. Do you think that they might have um, analogous signaling regimes? Absolutely, they do. Um, this is something has been looked actually in our institute in earlier times uh, a lot. I think it's the white color protein family, which is mm. doing this. White this color protein? A, I think I called white color, but okay. like, like color, uh, okay. not, not light color, but right. this, this thing you put around the neck. I'm sorry, right. I'm German. I have problems stuff sometimes differentiating these words. Um, yeah, but don't make me go into details there because I would be lying if I could tell, if I would say. You gave me I the words that. I need to look it up, so thank okay. you. Okay, welcome. Uh, I can also like look at the literature there and see if I can send you something on Twitter. We have a question from uh, Jimmy Acevedo. Um, Jimmy says, why was, quote, there must be a single state switching pigment, the first hypothesis, rather than there are two pigments which send opposing slash toggling signals? Are single compound switches like this common in biology? Um, at the point where absolutely relevant question, and this was actually in the 50s, what people have been criticized a lot about this experiments. This was actually what the people said. Yeah, why, why are you expecting one single pigment by uh, my two that have opposing uh, things? But yeah, Brothwick and all who did this experiment, they insisted on their single pigment hypothesis. And after 30 years of biochemistry, it turned out they were right. Um, are these switches to, uh, somehow common in biology? Yes and no. Um, this phytochrome fa photoreceptor family is pretty unique as a toggle switch, but is widely spread throughout the whole green uh, of life. So from cyanobacteria to uh, everything that has somehow uh, be able to do photosynthesis, you find these. But they're not too, uh, single component switches are not too common in biology. So what you have often have is you can activate and you have to wait some time until it turns off again. But these two different stimuli to turn on and off are rather unusual. Very interesting. So how does this relate to, to your work, Philip? Yeah, so um, I was thinking about if I want to like go into my work or just may, make a little bit foundation. And I decided to go a little bit into a more foundation and try to make why I am fascinated into this. And I am working on very abstruse ways on how phytochromes influence phase separation in plants. And this is actually uh, why I was interested in Ainsley's uh, phase separation thingies. Um, but I'm very, very much at the start there. Um, I just see there is definitely influence on how phase separation happens. And yeah, but I'm trying to have, wind my head around currently. I have no clue how it works. There's a really cool researcher named Silvia Vignolini, and I think she's at Oxford, but she's Italian by descent, and she is looking at structural colors and a wide array of things, including in plants. So she has some really cool papers. Um, cool. There, I'll see if I can find her stuff and drop it in the chat. That would be amazing. Thank you. So, um, do you want to tell us a little bit about some of the work you've done in the past? Like, what what, what did you do your uh, PhD research on? Ah, okay. So uh, basically, what I've been doing. So I started working on phytochromes at some point and uh, was looking at things that, like, 
would interacting with cytochromes that are uh, also sticking to it. And I found a very, very old and odd protein, which has been in every eukaryote, we find it. And for some reason it plants, it sticks to cytochromes. And it's part of a ancient multiprotein components, uh, multiprotein complex. And what I, what I could find out that by sticking to it, it could be dragged away from multi-complex component and thereby rearrange gene expression. So this very boring multi, uh, multi-panel figures of gene expression analysis, uh, but with a very cool twist of that um, evolutionary very old protein, which also be found in humans, uh, malaria, probably beetles as well. No, I'm sure it's in beetles as well. That has been really repurposed, reshaped into this uh, light signaling pathway, which has been doubled at some point. One does the old thing, which it does in all of the other uh, animals. And one has been newly, has been copied, has been doubled, and now does light signaling. I don't really know why, but uh, asking why in evolution is also some, sometimes a tricky thing because yeah, evolution does its thing and we end up with something. And it kind of feels always like, but at least to me, always evolution feels like why is it just duct tape holding things together? <laughs> That's it. That's true. It's stochastic. I guess so. I was good enough at the time for some reason, or maybe even not, right? It could just be, it evolved and it wasn't yeah. that bad. So it's, and it happened to stick around. So <laughs> yeah. And now, now, and then some point, okay, it was good, but now we cannot get rid of it anymore. And now we have to keep it, even though it's kind of stupid. Yeah, there's a lot of that. <laughs> yeah. So Philip, how did you get attracted to this field in the first place? Like when you were a, you know, a student, were you always interested in plants and and light and like take us back to the early days? How no, did, how did no, all this begin for you? Absolutely not. I didn't care about plants at all. I was I was studying uh, studying biology to cure cancer, as everybody, I guess. <laughs> and then I needed money. And I had my first student research assistant's job in a, in a lab of doing uh, like embryology of, uh, of plants. And I was like, plants have embryos? <laughs> really? And uh, actually this, this uh, really made me fascinated into this way of these plants that yeah, they cannot move, but they're at least as complex as animals or probably as complex as animals. And I'm just a little bit biased here, but uh, they're as complex as animals, even though they're, yeah, at some points a little bit like green stones to me at some point and I was barely keep being able to keep my students room plates plants alive but uh, yeah it kind of kind of stuck there. I was doing a little bit of synthetic biology at some point trying to make those photoreceptors work together with CRISPR to make uh, gene uh, uh, modifications on light but then I realized at some point I want to go back into the hard basic science and want to think want to figure out how things work and leave things that should be done by engineers to engineers. But it's the same for, uh, for Ainsley. How did you get, end up with, uh, with bugs? Um, I knew I wanted to do, I, when I was in, a teenager, I knew I was either gonna be a biologist or a cartoonist. And I thought, which one of those would be most lucrative and most likely to have a real stable career? And I thought, okay, biology. And I started out as an entomology major. I thought, I kind of like birds. What if I did bird behavior? I spent one summer working on bird behavior and it was such a pain in the ass to wait for a live animal to do what it was supposed to do to get the data you desperately needed that I said, this is ridiculous. Insect specimens only. Um, and if you want to make a discovery, if you want to discover and name a new species or a new genus, then there's beetles for that. I have more new species and genera of beetles than I will ever be able to describe in my lifetime. And it's just a race to get through as many as I can. Yeah, that, that's so fascinating. I mean, it is possible, and I don't say I can do this, to, to name every species of a plant in a, let's say, forest, if you know the environment. But for beetles, for insects, no way. No way, they're just so, so diverse. There's so many. And there's great, and there's always new stuff to learn about them. And even just within one species, there can be a whole other bio, you know, and a whole ecosystem, a whole biome. Yeah. There can be bacteria or fungi that live in an insect and do crazy things all by themselves. So, yeah. But I mean, studying one organism is complex, but now two organisms or two organisms interacting. My goodness, I, I guess 
It's so complex. That's why I prefer dead pinned specimens that can't move and don't behave and aren't going to change and are going to stay exactly as they are for hundreds of years. And I can pretend that species are fixed concepts and there's no introgression. And um, that's my cladistic approach to life and philosophy. Well, um, yeah, so, you know, I, I think it, yeah, we, we could go, we could go down that rabbit hole for sure. I think I won't touch that one. No species um, concepts talk. Absolutely. Right, right. Yep, nope, we, nope, should nope. Have, we should have a whole dorks on, on that. Cause that's a whole topic for, for us biologists. But, um, to basically a biologist. Sorry, I, I missed it. A Ainsley go. I just said we'd need stiffer drinks for that one. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. I, I would go for the cocktail that week. Philip, what did you say? <laughs> I was just saying it's basically a set of biologists ranting that species is such a strange concept. I always tell my you know intro biology students that it's kind of embarrassing as a biologist that that one of our fundamental units species is something we can't all agree on. You'd think we'd have that down by now but oops secrets out. <laughs> <laughs> well uh, Jimmy Acevedo has a question uh, for both panelists about evolution and duct tape as we were just discussing. Uh, is there a way to determine if X phenotype is a highly streamlined, optimized organism, as opposed to X phenotype happens to not be actively bad, so it's just stuck around? That's a good one. That's a great question. I don't know if that's yeah. possible. Something that can appear to us as clumsy ape-like vertebrates to be highly streamlined and optimized might appear from another or organismal perspective to be clumsy and barely hanging together. Um, and again, the stochastic nature of evolution means that nothing is setting out. Like when, when a, a branch comes off that phylogeny, it doesn't have a destination in mind. It's just getting directed by selection pressure through time. Yeah, I would kind of agree that it's difficult to say. And I would also add, it's all about the conditions you're looking at. Something that might look like Odd, like an odd phenotype that doesn't make too much sense when you're looking at it, might turn out to be absolutely important in some conditions you just didn't think about when setting up your experiments or your observations or when you found this beetle or plant in the wildlife. There are definitely some um, insects that you look at and you just say, what are you doing? Why are you shaped like that? This doesn't make any sense. This is absurd. Like um, small headed flies are flies that just have their head is just a pair of eyeballs stuck together. And that's basically it. You're like, why? Why? Why have you done this? This doesn't make any sense. But who can say? Uh, there's, you know, there's so, so much we don't know about any given species, except maybe Drosophila melanogaster that, <laughs> or Arabidopsis, that um, there's just. Yeah mysteries upon mysteries upon mysteries and there's you'll never run out of questions to ask exactly i mean currently we're in the state of we kind of have the, the impression that we understand a little bit about like drosophila and arabidopsis how they are going and then we say okay this is how it's worked for arabidopsis so every plant must behave exactly the same and no questions asked and don't you dare ask me questions yeah mm -hmm. And, and what they're doing now may be completely different from what they did in the past, right? You could go out and measure all day and figure out, oh, okay, this doesn't seem to do the organism any good right now, but maybe it did it at, at some point in the past, right? Or in some other environment that we haven't measured it in. Yeah. Yeah. It sometimes feels like a 17th century alchemist just wiggling at things and some things happen and we describe it and yeah. Maybe in 200, 300 years, people will see it as and laugh at us our, our clumsy way of trying to figure out how yeah. things work in biology. But the funny thing about this conversation is I feel like when, you know, I'm going back to my, I'm, I'm just starting the semester, I'm going to be teaching introductory biology again, which I love doing. And one of the things that I always find is, is kind of surprising for students coming into an introductory science class is I feel like students often have the idea that we know most of the field already and we're just sort of <laughs> finessing the details now. Whereas like this conversation that we're having now makes it clear there's so much we don't know, right? And there's things that we think we know, but we're open to the possibility that what we, we think might actually be fundamentally wrong. <laughs> and I, to me, that's exciting, right? To me, that's like, well, 
there's so much more that we need to do. We're not anywhere close to being done uh, just documenting the world, much less understanding like how it came to be and, and why. Um, so I, I don't know, maybe I'm an optimist, but like I see that as like, that's one of the things that makes it so cool to be a scientist, to be a biologist to me in particular, because I'm so fascinated by life. And sounds like you guys both are too. Yeah, Scott, thank you for making that excellent case for descriptive biology. More people should do descriptive biology. It doesn't all have to be experimental, God dang it. I mean, that's where it starts, right? You can't do any interesting experiments if you haven't gone out and made some basic observation about what there is out there, right? Yeah. And I would Absolutely. argue that we're far away from being completely a deterministic science. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of description we will still be doing until we can say, okay, we're done describing things, so. Oh, for sure. Ainsley, you mentioned um, earlier this uh, point in your life when you were trying to decide between biology and being a cartoonist. But from what I understand, you may have pursued biology, uh, you know, for your PhD and for your job, but I think you're still doing some uh, some of the, the cartoon work too. Is that right? A little bit of stealth cartooning. Yeah, I have a, I've had a few little comic book stories published in anthologies. And I do um, art and illustration just within reach. I have a, a painting of some plants. Look, Philip, I draw a plant. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think it's a U4, maybe. Um, and uh, yeah, I do it for fun. I do scientific illustration because when you're describing a new species of beetle, the most important thing is that you draw a picture of its genitalia. That's just how insect taxonomy works. Um, there are some taxa for which we use different features on the body, but mostly it's the genitalia. And you, if, if you can't do it yourself, you got to find someone else to do it for you. So. And it's great because this is a, like a long lost art, literally. I mean, it used to be that naturalists all had to illustrate their work because there weren't other tools available before we had access to, you know, photography and, and other. It used to be the naturalists. Uh, had to pay somebody to illustrate their work. And that was a job that you can have. And now um, scientific illustration is really not a way that a lot of people can support themselves anymore, which is right. a real bummer, but people still love doing it. So yeah. Well, where could people go if they wanted to see some of your uh, illustration work? Well, gosh, I have a little bit of it linked on my, um, on my off my pinned tweet on Twitter and um I would say that's a good place to start. I have a link to my very long defunct Tumblr that has some stuff, I have some artwork on it. And I just occasionally put things on Twitter, put things on Tumblr, that's about it. Um, I have a website that I occasionally put nerdy biology or entomology themed t-shirts up on for sale. Um, and I'm not going to promote it here because I'm not here to promote my t-shirts, <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I'll, uh, put that, I, I guess I could, I, I could drop that in the chat if people would like, or. Yeah, or we can, you know, we can also um, tweet it out later with our, sure. uh, our dorks chat uh, Twitter. Actually, we had some, some questions uh, in uh, related to this in the Q and A, uh, Bill Rokenbeck says Ainsley's comic t-shirts are very popular among bug photography workshop participants uh, and actually not. had, had, had also mentioned that uh, he said, I recently ruined my favorite know your flies t-shirt by spilling pottery glaze on it. Are they still available somewhere? <laughs> let's see. Let's see. Let me see if I can find it. Um, I have a, uh, I used to have a site on Teespring where I would put things like that. And I'm going to see if I can find it anymore. Um, let's see. Here we go. Here it is. Here it is. I think you can still order shirts here. I am going to. Yep. There we go. I am dropping it into uh, the chat. Do, 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 chat. Who can see this? Let's see. Take me back to the chat. Here we go. Everyone. There we go. There's a link. Um, I've got shirts that you can wear if you want to antagonize your uh, dip dressed friends. And um, I've got one that is a collaboration between me and former guest Rosemary Moscow um, that says parasitism is the sincerest form of flattery. And it's written on a beautiful scroll that upon closer inspection is a tapeworm. Oh my goodness. I love that. I'm definitely going to be checking that out. 
I actually, you know, I was out in my backyard the other day and uh, went to sit down and uh, right there on the table was uh, some, some bird poop. But what caught my eye was what was crawling out of the bird poop. There was a tapeworm. Wow. <laughs> and I was oh, like, that's amazing. Of course, my initial reaction was like, that's super gross. I'm going to sit somewhere else. And then my <laughs> immediate next reaction was like, where's my camera? I got to go document this. Which Where I did. is your camera? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I put some, some pictures on Twitter and uh, immediately had some colleagues who were like, you need to, you know, preserve that in ethanol and send it to us, which I did too. So yeah, that's, that's the way it goes as a biologist. <laughs> I love it. Um, well, we'll definitely check out uh, that, that website and see, and see some of your work there. Um, guys, this has been so much fun. Uh, Philip, you're, you're a real uh, a sport for, for staying up late with us and, and taking a break from your D&D marathon. I appreciate that. Um, and thank you to, to both Ainsley Sego and Philip Schwenk for, for joining us and, and talking about um, light and cool things that we can learn about both um, how plants perceive light and how beetles manipulate light, I guess you could say. Um, so thank you both. All right. Thank you for running this series. It's a hoot and a holler and I love it and it brings me joy. So absolutely. Wonderful. I'm super happy. Very right. good. And uh, once again, uh, Kelly Wiener Smith wasn't able to join us today, but she sends her best wishes and apologies. And uh, I'm sure she'll be back next time. So hope everybody can uh, join us again in the future for um, more dorks. We've got a great uh, lineup coming up that we'll be tweeting about um, at, at jo uh, excuse me, at dorks chat. So go ahead and follow us on Twitter for information about upcoming dorks. And uh, we'll be sharing the recording here on our uh, YouTube channel soon too. So right. thanks everyone. Right. Take care. See Have you next time. Thanks. Take care guys.